ways. Um, you can use your personal network, reach out to families you know, we'll test it with a, a family, and then they're like, we really enjoyed the experience. I bet there's other students at the are in our class that would love to participate. And so then they'll introduce me to other families um, and I'll reach out and connect with them. Sometimes they introduce me to the teachers. Um, and normally when I come visit the school, the principal stops by because they're a dutiful principal and they need to know what's going on. And uh, I have a great chats with them. I explain what the product does. Sometimes I actually can then then make a reverse connection where we can then lead to sales, which is great. Because uh, <laughs> they actually saw the product in real action and they're impressed. And so that's how I make a lot of like word of mouth connections. Sometimes if we want to get into a new district or a special kind of school, I'll cold call. Um, and I use some of my Southern charm, you know, and, and you know, people can tell right away if you're being authentic. You have to be really respectful of their time. Um, and I treat it as, as a special opportunity for the students to learn something that they might not have gotten in their classroom. And so I, I prepare for classroom teaching session. I check in with the teacher. Um, and so building that kind of reputation, teachers love spreading us around and saying like, this is a great opportunity. I was able to kick back for two hours, you know, and, that, and that's the kind of way you need to approach it. Um, take it very seriously. Um, it's their time, not yours. They're providing you the opportunity. A lot of bigger companies pay to go in schools too. We never do that. Uh, we just ask to come in um, and kind of make a, a, a connection on we're trying to change education. Um, and it's a great opportunity to teach young learners how they can do that, be part of that change. There's two kinds we have. We have observational visits where we, we literally, I sit in the back, I make sure kids cannot see me because that affects what you're observing if they're constantly trying to interact with you. And so I usually give 10 minutes of time for the kids to relax and not notice I'm there anymore. And then I can start um, kind of observing and writing down data. I never bring a camera or a uh, or my phone to take photos. One, privacy. I respect the student's privacy. But two, that is an intrusive element. Um, a lot of times um, our team's like, oh, I wish I had photos to reference. And I'm like, I understand that would help some of the process, but this helps me get better results. And so that's something for you as an individual to talk with your organization on what works best for your organization. So going to the classroom, if uh, that was an observational experience. So if I'm going into testing, I have a, a formula down that I use where I come in, I introduce myself and have my team introduce themselves as well. Um, you always wanna bring at least another person for uh, privacy reasons. Um, and so there's accountability because you are in a, a classroom space. So you come in, um, you introduce the team, and then next you hand out the kits um, or whatever the products. I always bring multiples. I predetermine how many students are in the classroom so I can bring enough kits. It's a lot of work preparing, so we usually have kids double up or triple up in groups. Our personal product is a collaborative experience, especially in the classroom versus at home private use. And so it just lends itself naturally. And then you observe. Um, I train everyone on my team how to observe, how to ask questions. You never solve the problems. Giving them the answer is actually changing the results of what you're trying to observe. And so the point is just to be there as emotional support. And if they're starting to get frustrated, um, let them work through that frustration, but never tell them how to do it because they need to build that self-confidence um, in figuring it out. Lastly, um, when you are in a testing environment and you they finished doing the build and you observed all the features being like, stumbling points, design flaws that you need to go back and improve. Then I bring a survey and I create a kind of like a circle group 
where we all can be on equal level as peers. And I sit on the floor and I have a conversation with them. I ask them what they struggled with, what they felt they succeeded, what they didn't understand, what they thought was dumb. I just, you know, I talk to them. I, and then, you know, I, uh, I have a database that I've built over the years of um, their favorite kind of products, their favorite kind of experiences, what are their challenges every day. And I ask those questions every time. I make sure I try to ask in the same way so I don't skew the results. But it is qualitative, and so it's not going to be statistical data. It's going to be more of opportunity areas that you can explore for the product. Um, and so I would say in a nutshell, you introduce yourself, establish yourself, build that trust, and then uh, you observe them as they do the experience. Once again, reaffirming that trust so they, they know that you're there to support them, but, uh, and they can ask you anything, keeping yourself open, excited about the opportunity, um, and then the kids will trust you and they'll be more excited about helping you. And lastly, um, sitting and talking to them. You were a kid. A lot of adults, I always find it fun. They're like, oh, it's, kids are scary. And I'm like, were you scared of yourself? And, you know, you, a lot of people lose touch within that inner child. And so I kind of like work with my team to get, if they, if they feel disconnected from them, helping them get back into that mindset. We design products for kids, for young learners. And so if you're not thinking like a kid, and you can't interact with them, you can't design for them. So you have to put your mind, uh, your head space into the, the mind of the young learner.